science is magic that's real. And now, physicists have managed to record variation of curved space-time using the most precise clock ever made. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I'm Brian Keating, the Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics at the University of California, San Diego. I'm an experimental cosmologist. I'd like to give you the experimentalist point of view, in contradistinction to my many brilliant colleagues who discuss the radical theories that shape our perception of time, space, and even the philosophy of life itself. Before we unpack the most precise clock ever made and the consequences of this new experiment, we need to understand the concept of curved space-time. Einstein said his happiest thought was that an observer in free fall would experience no gravitational fields. The implication was that an astronaut accelerating through space at 1 g could not tell that he or she was not on Earth. Space and time, and therefore mass and energy, are strongly linked together. For mass and energy, we have the most famous equation in all of science, E equals mc squared. But for space and time, it's not necessarily as simple as that. I'll start with a simple analogy. Suppose you have a piece of paper, and you've drawn two points on it, point A and point B. Now let's suppose that you want to find the distance between them. The easiest way would be to grab a ruler, right? Line the ruler up with both points, and no matter which way the paper is oriented, or even if you fold it up, the ruler will still tell you exactly how far away A is from B. But now, imagine if, instead of a physical ruler, you drew a ruler on the same piece of paper, going from A to B. The ruler gives you the same measurement as the physical one if the paper is flat. But if you fold it up in any particular way, the physical ruler gives you a distance that's much smaller than the ruler on paper does. In other words, you, the outside observer, see the points as closer together, while the point A doesn't see itself as any closer or further from B than when it started. This analogy maps onto the real world in effect. If I, as the observer, am on point A on the piece of paper, and some object I'm observing is at point B, no matter how I try to physically measure my distance from it, I'll get the same result as always because I'm always on the same piece of paper as the distant point. So how do I know the curvature of space-time between us? How do I measure it? In the paper analogy, what does the physical ruler represent? It goes by many different names, but here I'll call it what physicists call it, the invariant interval. The absolute distance between two points in space-time, and it's the same independent of whether or not two different observers are in relative motion with respect to one another. This was Einstein's key insight into what is now called special relativity. The beautiful thing is, by measuring the difference between the invariant interval and my spatial separation from point B, which I'm observing, I can actually draw conclusions about how space-time is curved between me and point B. So there's the physical or covariant or varying distance that I measure, and then there's the invariant interval that all observers would measure independent of their orientation or placement in space-time. Even more interestingly, thanks to Einstein's key insight about space and time being tied together, you can measure differences in perceived time and the proper time as determined by the invariant interval to do the same thing. The appropriate question is when the are they? Time and space are on the same footing in special relativity. Einstein's key insight. A somewhat unfamiliar conception. With today's technology, it's actually extremely easy to measure distances in time. It's actually much easier for us to do that than to measure distance in space, thanks to the atomic clock. You see, for distances in space, you need to set extremely precise starting and ending points for every point you measure in order for us to get any insight on a small enough scale experiment. And to measure very, very short distances could still translate into very, very large time differentials. For example, light travels about one foot in a nanosecond, so measuring an inch is only one twelfth of a nanosecond. That's a huge distance in time, 100 trillionths of a second approximately, but that's actually a very, very difficult amount of distance to measure. So any uncertainties in that can accrue to very large errors in our perceived elapsed time intervals. But the atoms and molecules in our world act as very precise clocks or timepieces. We can use that precision predictability in time to conduct and create clocks that measure the movement of these atoms and give us extremely precise time interval measurements. 
These atomic clocks and the principles of relativity, researchers from the lab of Jun Yi at Jila Laboratory at Boulder, Colorado, have made an incredible discovery. Now, for starters, this experiment was carried out with what's called a strontium optical lattice clock. To put it simply, this is a clock that uses lasers in a very precise way to create a stable grid of light waves, shaped almost like an egg carton. Strontium atoms sit in the depressions in this egg carton, keeping them from interfering with each other. The electrons in a strontium atom's orbital shells are pretty difficult to excite. They'll only go up in an energy level if there's a very specific frequency of light that hits them. When those electrons start getting excited, we know exactly what wavelength or energy of light was exciting them. It tells us precisely what frequency of light is being absorbed. Since frequency in physics is just the inverse of time, 1 over t, we can use the frequency of the outgoing light as well as the frequency of the strontium atom's excitation to get an extremely accurate atomic clock, measuring the difference between incoming and outgoing frequencies. The strontium atom in this egg carton is sort of set up by external potentials, electrostatic potentials, which forms inside this cloud of strontium atoms. So the atom's isolation from other external effects meant that the researchers were able to measure the precise difference in time between the top of the cloud and the bottom of the cloud here in their laboratory on Earth. The top and bottom of the cloud experienced different gravitational force fields. But since the atoms were all in the same cloud, they could isolate a lot of the noise and systematic errors could be avoided in their data something that becomes extremely important when you get to extremely tiny differences in time intervals. How small a difference were the Jila scientists able to measure? Well, for this experiment, they measured a time difference on the order of 10 to the minus 19 seconds. That is less than 110 billionth of a billionth of a second. One billion, gajillion, fifillion. A decimal place followed by 18 zeros and a one. This time difference seems small, but don't forget, light in one second can travel 300,000 kilometers. So it can actually correspond to a sizable macroscopic distance. Now these individual atoms, with their electrons getting excited, forms a quantum system that is interacting in order to show the effects of relativity. This type of experiment, although not this exact experiment, could have implications for the measurement of what's called quantum gravity. Taking a quantum system, that is in a gravitational field and exploring the ways in which gravity affects its quantum properties. The real star, the key enabling technology, was the optical lattice setup that the researchers used in their experiment. These lattices allowed them to exert an incredible control over individual atoms within a cloud of them. Yi's laboratory at Jilla is improving all the time. With this technology, you can measure the properties of gravity on an atomic scale. This will give us insight into the behavior of quantum gravity. There's also the research into pure quantum mechanics in a gravitational setting. You see, anytime the world, an experimentalist or an experiment, interacts with a quantum system, it destroys the properties, collapses the wave function, so to speak, in what's called the Copenhagen interpretation, performing a measurement. This focuses it into one state, destroying its otherwise quantum or spread out or diffuse level properties as the measurement gets made. This can also include the effects of interacting with gravity. So how this measurement will improve our understanding of gravity and quantum mechanics remains to be seen, but the journey has just begun. These clocks are getting ever more precise and the control that experimentalists have over individual quantum systems will allow us to explore quantum mechanics on the atomic scale, helping us to better understand the nature of time, space, and gravity itself. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to click here to watch this video asking about whether or not physicists have discovered a fifth force of nature in addition to the two nuclear forces, the force of gravity, and the force of electromagnetism. And don't forget to subscribe.